three, two, one. Welcome, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, one and all. So we've done it again, guys. We got another big guy here today, mm -hmm. so I'm sure you guys will recognize him. We have Derek of Veritasium. Mm -hmm. So you guys uh, should know this gentleman here. He's yes. got several physics channels. Um, he also, you know, has uh, Veritasium on Instagram, Veritasium on Twitter, I believe, as well. And uh, the website, Veritasium.com. Derek, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah. Welcome to the Eigen Bros podcast featuring Eigen Ketz as well for our fans. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. This is a physics podcast, as uh, which is they're very rare to begin with. Mm -hmm. But... Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you guys got to be in the top top few physics podcasts <laughs> that's globally. Right. By default, <laughs> by default. Yeah. <laughs> well, can you turn my uh, headphones down? Yeah, a little yeah, bit? I got you. Appreciate got you. it, man. So, Derek, yeah, man, we uh, we're so glad to have you out here, man. I know you were we were talking earlier about your quarantine situation, um, but uh, how you hanging in there, man? Pretty good. Yeah, I'm all right. You know, I feel like I'm in a really fortunate position. California is not a bad place to ride out, you know, stay at home mm -hmm. orders and stuff like that. And, uh, uh, you know, as I was saying to you guys, it's given me a chance to sort of spend a couple months with my kids, uh, almost uninterrupted time, which is both like really good. And it also, you know, at a point it's like, I got to get back to work. I got to get back to, to doing some, some science. So yeah, you right, know, right. I'm, I'm sort of doing that transition now. Yeah. You can't recruit the kids to help you out on some of the videos? <laughs> yeah, maybe in a few years. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, are you inundating them with, like, physics knowledge? And they're like, just, Dad, stop. <laughs> We've heard about <laughs> the solar system a thousand times. Yeah, they got a lot of books about space and about rockets and gravity. And there's a lot of a space theme around the house. Mm. They seem to be pretty into it, though, so that's good. That is good. Yeah, some of it. the... Uh, just for the audience, I don't know. Some some people may not know. Um, Derek, your wife is also a um, planetary scientist as well, correct? That's right. Yeah. So she drives a lot of this sort of interest <laughs> in space, astronomy, getting the telescope out. You know, when SpaceX was launching, we had that up. Uh, you know, on a projector in the in the living room, so they could check it out. So yeah, yeah, Fantastic. definitely a sort of a space heavy family. Cool. Very yeah. nice. Yeah, yeah, me and Juan were actually in Florida, so we tried to go down for the um, first launch. Yeah. Unfortunately, it was scrubbed, and we had to come back, and yeah, we missed it the second time around, so yeah. tear was shed. We were trying to be a part <laughs> yeah, of Yeah, that's so sad, man. Yeah. Get down to 17 minutes before it's going to go. and <laughs> Yeah, yeah that's a bummer, brutal. but yeah. next it's time. Fine. Yeah, maybe next time. <laughs> maybe the Mars mission. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But anyway, um, Derek, so we wanted to get a little bit of um, understanding what your background is, man. So I know you um, went to university in Canada, and you also went uh, in Australia, I believe. But um, you're also a PhD in physics education. So could you just tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, my background's a little weird. Um, I call myself the Commonwealth kid a little bit because my parents – or South African. My, my family goes back a long way in South Africa. Uh, but then my family moved to Canada and then to Australia where I was born and then back to Canada, you know, when I was about two years old. So I'm mostly Canadian, but I also mm -hmm. have sort of pieces of Australia, South Africa. And uh, so I grew up in, in Canada. I went to university, did my undergrad at Queen's University in Canada, engineering physics. Um, which was a pretty, pretty good program. And then uh, I moved to Australia straight after graduating. And I kind of wanted to be in a creative industry. You know, I wanted to be making, making films or something like that. Uh, but I just thought that, you know, being a, a sort of traditional filmmaker was a, a poor career choice. Like I thought it's really hard to break into that industry. It, it also felt to me like it wasn't a meritocracy. You know, I felt like I was mm. good at science and that uh, that was a meritocracy. You know, you get ahead by, you know, doing the work and being able to figure stuff out, you know, so it felt like I could do those sorts of things. I, I just didn't know about breaking into a creative career. Um, so, you know, ended up in Australia thinking like, uh, I want to merge my interest in, you know, being a filmmaker with also my passion for science and my ability to, to do that kind of work. And that's where the PhD came in with this idea of like, maybe I can make a PhD around how to 
teach physics with film. Um, that was sort of the concept going into it. And uh, the challenge of a PhD is like it absorbs your whole life. And yeah. I didn't feel like it really managed to allow me to make cool films. And it also didn't allow me to do hardcore science research. So it was a, yeah. it was a really tough thing mm -hmm. that like didn't end up uh, really hitting where I wanted it to. But long term, it has served me very well to have, you know, a background and in, in, in years of sort of studying and looking at the literature around, you know, creating media that helps people learn. Um, so it has turned out to be useful. I worked for a while at a tutoring company while I was doing my PhD, and I, I worked full time for them after that for about uh, two or three years. And at some point, I got to this point in my life where I was like, probably 27, 28 years old. And I, I thought, you know, this whole my whole life, I've told myself, like, I want to be creative, I want to be making films, that's what I, you know, dream of doing. And yet, I've sort of focused on doing very sort of safe things, all the way up, you know, getting engineering and getting a PhD. And it just felt like, you know, I was always doing something that was like, the smart choice in the moment, as opposed to something that fit with what my deep underlying passions were. Mm. Uh, and so, so yeah, I quit my job at the end of 2010. And I, I thought like, you know, if I don't embrace this now, when am I going to do it? And so I just started making YouTube videos. And that's, that's sort of like how it all started. And it's just snowballed from there. Um, Very so that, interesting. Kind of, so you're actually yeah. a, a media guy first and foremost. I was wondering why it well, listed like, you that way on I, your Wikipedia. I wanted to be creative. I wanted to be creative. I wanted to be like, you know, growing growing up I did plays, you know, I was into theater, I was into film, uh, you know, animations, whatever, stuff like that. Like, I don't know. I like that the sort of art of storytelling and that craft. I also like, you know, a project based workflow where it's like right now this is the project and it's got a beginning, a middle and an end. And it goes out in the world. There's some response or whatever. And I get to move on and do the next one. Mm -hmm. So I really like that sort of workflow. Um, I, I personally found research quite stifling for my <laughs> personality that, you know, it, it feels like a, the kind of place where you could spend six months or a year or two years and like it's all wasted at the end of that, you know, like you could find that you were going down a dark, you know, a, a blind alley kind of thing. And like, right. It doesn't work out. And then you got to go back and start again. For me, like that's a really tough thing for me to handle. Uh, and so I'm, I much prefer this sort of <laughs> ability to turn things around more rapidly and sort of have an engagement with a, a large group of people. Like I really enjoy that. It, it, it works in my personality. I cool. see. Yeah. Yeah. You're you're in a in a good um in good uh space here, uh, Derek, because we're very much in that same kind of creative physicist sphere. And yeah. that's kind of one thing I've longed for with physics was more of a creative element. I mean, there's a lot of creativity that can go into physics, but there is something true about what you're saying where it's, it feels kind of stifling in some sense, where you're just all physics and it makes it so you can't really branch out to do a lot of other things, especially in PhD. Um, so yeah, I can definitely commiserate with you um, very much on that. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of yeah. I'm kind of intrigued about because you said I, you had this like dream of doing film, but why the 180 to to science? Like it, it, up until well, that point, it, it, I don't think it was a major 180 for me. Like I like to challenge. Um, you know, I also feel like at the core of my personality is some sort of uh, competitiveness, like a, a, a real deep competitiveness that whatever <laughs> I saw anyone doing, I was like, oh, yeah, they can do that. Well, I can do that better. You know, like <laughs> I, I, I felt this need to, to do that. And part of that is the physicist mindset, right? Like physicists think that they can solve everyone's problems better than they can solve them. Like, <laughs> you know, it's like phys physics is everything, man. Like it's chemistry and, you know, it's biology, whatever. Like yeah. those are just little pieces of physics that have, you know, in particular zones or whatever. That's, that's, and, and like, yeah, I, I think physicists are generally arrogant because of this sort <laughs> of worldview that like, yeah, everything, everything falls under the rubric of physics and we can, we can solve it all. Um, so I guess, you know, when I was growing up, uh, you know, I, I wanted to compete at different things. And like I was I was pretty good at school. So I worked hard at that. And, you know, I did well and I enjoyed science because it made sense. And because there were some, you know, deep regularities that we could understand about our world like that really appealed to me. So, you know, uh, and I guess like a core part of me is also like this this search for truth and this belief that like if we can figure out what's actually going on and the way things actually work, we can all lead better lives. 
Um, and so science plays a big role in that. So, you know, in high school, I was, I was really good at science um, and, you know, graduated top of my class and, and finished, you know, very high up in biology, physics, chemistry, so a triple threat and the logical thing to do at, at university was to to continue that yeah um yeah so like it wasn't a 180 it was just that like you know science was something i felt i was good at and i and i could demonstrate ability and but like what brought me more joy was you know being in in a, a theater production or doing a musical or you know i don't know making a making a short film or something like that that brought me a lot of um, satisfaction above and beyond what science could. Mm. So, um, Derek, do you actually have any, uh, do you have any hidden gems of short films you've done out there? Uh, I wouldn't say hidden gems. There's like <laughs> this horrible, horrible stuff that I did. You know, when I was in university with my buddies, we would make like these stupid little comedy sketches and things like that. We made about 25 videos, uh, in the course of two or three years, um, and we were all like engineering students, so like the acting's not great, but we made videos. <laughs> my, my buddies always wanted to make something with like a gimmick, and it was always like looking at what was popular in the minute. So, you know, we made videos about vampires or, uh, you know, pirates or, right. you know, yeah, or like Yeti, Bigfoot, that sort of stuff. Like we did, we did really <laughs> silly things. What? Any zombies? Zombies. There were no zombies. I feel okay. like zombies weren't a thing. Like uh, we were making this between like 2002, 2004, like that kind of time period. Oh, okay. Like yeah, YouTube, yeah. YouTube didn't exist yet. So like my buddy was creating our own server, which ran out of like a, a an old computer in our closet upstairs, <laughs> and we were like, you know exporting our videos so that people could watch them around campus and we were like putting stickers up so people would know to come to our website because like we had to try to get web traffic somehow mm. so people would come and see this stuff Amazing. but like it, it just it wasn't great you know it was just like it was a training ground for us yeah and so, i would love to see some of those videos yeah same they're really bad they're really bad <laughs> but that gave you some experience in a sense yeah. right going into youtube i yeah. guess yeah oh yeah yeah but i mean like that was yeah, su super early, but you know, I was into like I bought a camera, I had the editing, you know, software and stuff, and so I was doing a lot of the kind of like directing my friends into, you know, this is roughly the story, but like I would pick all the all the shots and like set it up and tell them what to do, and then I'd get home and and put it all together. So, yeah, um, I guess you could consider that early experience, but you know, you could look at my videos from 2010 or 2011 when I really started doing YouTube full time and like, yeah. they weren't very good. Um, so for as much experience and as, as much time I'd spent, you know, mm -hmm. performing and, and working on stuff like this, I, I still like was pretty new when I, when I started in 2011. So, hmm. you know, even so it's, it's come a long way in the last 10 years. How do you, how do you feel like physics helped you um, in this career path that you took, like in terms of just the create creative aspect of doing film and, you know, doing stuff at Netflix and things like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, the biggest way that it's helped me is it's kind of made me a subject matter expert in the things that I talk about. Right. So I guess that's that's a big piece. I don't know if understanding physics has had a, a any impact on, like, the creative side. I feel like that's is almost like it's a different... Uh, subject altogether a different skill set or something like it's I, I, I think of them kind of separately but you know definitely the subject matter um, yeah which is you know what I talk about so, <laughs> right, of mostly yeah yeah I know you um, so I, I, we were looking of course through your Wikipedia and I saw some of the people who you work with and I didn't realize you um, worked with Bill Nye on his uh, thing how yeah, was yeah. that yeah that was cool. That was really cool. You know, when I grew up, w we would watch Bill's show in like eighth grade science. Yeah. And I had this teacher who had Jolly Ranchers, like a big bag of them. And we would watch like an episode. And then at the end, he would ask us questions that like were answered in the episode. And if you got it right, he would throw Jolly Ranchers at you. So nice. like... I feel like, I don't know if people be allowed to do that these days, but back in those days, like, I guess we weren't so worried about sugar, but, um, <laughs> but like he, he was a cool science teacher and that was like a fun thing that we would do. Yeah. Um, interesting. So yeah. So, so I guess he was like an early science hero of mine getting to work alongside him was, was a lot of fun and he's a, he's a great guy to work with and hang out with and yeah. Um, yeah. And did you yeah, like, that, did you crack open a beer and was like, Bill, 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 Bill. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, 
it, it, he had like Halloween parties at his house and stuff like oh, that. Nice. Like he's, oh, he's fun. And I, just, I consider him like, you know, he's like uncle Bill and yeah. Um, mm. oh, yeah. He, he's, <laughs> he's hung out with my kids too. And he's really, that's like, cool. He, he's a good sort of like that kind of uncle character. Right. But no, he's great. Yeah. And, and, and he's like a legend of, of, of science and science communication and, and TV. So uh, it was a real like pleasure just to, to work with him. Cool. Very cool. I do wonder how many beers uh, Bill could chug. <laughs> but um, <laughs> mathematically, given yeah. his height and BMI, maybe you can approximate. Uh. <laughs> but anyway, so yeah, um, it was interesting actually too, Derek. Thinking uh, thinking about the comedic stuff. So you were saying you did the comedy videos in the past. Um, I actually saw your uh, your appearance on Tiger Belly too, which I thought was very interesting and kind of. Um, unexpected yeah because um i wasn't i didn't didn't know that you guys were going to be doing that and those worlds colliding was kind of interesting uh how was yeah. it uh, interesting for Bobby me Lee? too <laughs> <laughs> friends they're, they're friends of friends so yeah no someone made the connection and i was like sure whatever i'll, I'll, I'll have a conversation <laughs> so it was kind of just random off the cuff yeah 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 which is like most of this stuff which yeah. is just really yeah yeah it was cool though because uh, I was I thought it was hilarious how he was asking you so many medical doctor questions. <laughs> I was like, does he know any other doctor besides uh, <laughs> besides Bobby's, a medical doctor? Yeah, Bobby's so funny though. So, but definitely but, out of my depth. Yeah. But you have met him in real life, right? Yeah, yeah. We okay. went to a wedding together. So, yeah. Right, right. That's cool. Okay. Very interesting though. Um, but on, on the physics train again, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of your older videos there, um, Derek. So you, one of your videos, man, is like, is one of my top videos. Um, the one that you did on the, um, the logistic map. So that one was completely mind blowing to me. And just being able to see the relationship between the logistic map and the Mandelbrot set, I thought that was really crazy, man. How how did you even uh, come up with that idea? You know, certain things come across my plate and they tickle something inside me, probably the same way they did with you, right? And um, and I just, I feel like I need to make a video about them. So the origin of that video probably goes back like 12, 13 years and reading the book Chaos by James Gleek, um, which is a really cool book and I recommend it to everyone you know, I didn't know as much about chaos. Like I kind of came through and I, I knew a little bit about it, but like reading that book really opened my eyes. And I remember there were some topics in there that I really wanted to get back to. And so, yeah, just looking at the logistic map and I mean, he doesn't, he, he, he mentions the Mandelbrot set and stuff in that book. But then I was like, well, how does this really pertain to the Mandelbrot set? And then trying to figure out what happens to those numbers as they stay finite or don't. Uh, and realizing that that is the same mapping as, as the logistic map. I mean, that stuff, I mean, it's just, it's crazy cool. Um, you can find that sort of stuff in Wikipedia, but it's normally not told in a sort of storytelling way where you get the, this sort of like bigger sense that the universe has some deep structure. Um, so that's, that's like m my goal in sort of creating this video is to say, this is what I think is really cool. And this is why, and putting all those pieces together in a way that hopefully takes you to a place, you know, mentally and also maybe emotionally that, that, um, you know, makes you feel as excited as I felt. Mm -hmm. Making that video was almost like one of the most, the, the longest times that I've put into a video because I would film sections and then like put them in the timeline and realize that they didn't quite do what I wanted. Or like I was working with my animator and telling him I wanted certain things and I'd look at them and like they weren't quite hitting. And so, you know, there was, it's funny for a video about like iterations, it was one of my most <laughs> iterated videos because I would like keep making stuff and keep shooting stuff and then just like scrapping it and then like starting mm -hmm. again. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's it's tricky to sort of get across the idea that you really want in in a way that feel satisfying to me but but I'm, I'm pleased with where that video got to so I'm, I'm glad you you felt the same thing oh yeah when that mandel brought flipped i mean i yeah. just i threw up every <laughs> i was just like all right that's it yeah he flipped the table yeah 
It was uh, it was next it's level. It's so cool. It's <laughs> when I see that those moments exist. It's when I see those things that I'm like, oh, this has to be a video, and they ha- like I have to make this, and I just become kind of obsessed with it until it's done. So yeah, that's that's how that went down with that one. Yeah, that was very cool. Very cool. So since you did your PhD in physics education, did you like? Did, do you have this? I mean, I, your videos are obviously. Uh, a sign that you can dissect these ideas and make them palatable to a wider audience. But um, would you ever want to go like get a university job at some point and like teach Mm. physics? So I actually did lecture for a while, Mm. uh, particularly at UTS university of technology, Sydney. And I taught their first year uh, physics course for non-majors. It's like a, 400 seat lecture kind of uh course um and i enjoyed that like i enjoy the performance aspect of of teaching and being a lecturer i don't know if that's somewhere i would go back to i kind of feel like my classroom has expanded yeah you know when i when i was growing up i used to tutor like people just for fun because i like i enjoyed the the whole teaching process i enjoy helping people understand things and you know that's continued through to this day, but I used to do it in like a one-on-one format or a one-on-two or whatever. And then at some point I was at this tutoring company where we had classes of up to 14. So that was the typical size. And then when I was lecturing, it was up to 400. And then pretty soon, you know, it became 400,000 and 4 million. And, you know, that, that's really exciting to me, you know, to try to reach a, a really broad audience. So I feel like that's the direction that I'm going. At the same time, you know, it, it is always fun to like be in the room with people and I enjoy that too. So, you know, sometimes I go and give talks for teachers or for, uh, you know, rare student groups. Mostly it's for teachers, I think, these days. And, and like I, I really enjoy doing that. So I do enjoy being in the room with people, but I wouldn't see it as a, sort of a regular ongoing thing. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Never say never. <laughs> Who knows what will happen. Yeah, because yeah. I, w- I wonder, I, I look at you, I look at the videos and the catalog of videos that you've made and I think like... You know, here's a guy who like can get these concepts and then break them down and and make them digestible and stuff. And as a TA, for I, me and Terrence have both been TAs, and uh, I, I kind of want to know if there's like a guiding set of principles that you use in terms of like to to, to teaching physics. I don't know if there's a guiding set of principles. It's interesting to come out of physics education and think like, all right. There's some things that you can say scientifically about teaching. <laughs> um, I, I can give you a couple examples. Sure. I mean, so, some, some of the major things that come to mind, I made this video, The Science of Thinking, which was originally called The Uncomfortable Effort of Thinking. But it's, a, it's the same idea about like, how do we think? How do we learn? I mean, there, there's some fundamental things about our psychology, which I feel like kind of get marginalized because they're so easy and so well known. For example, I think one of the core things anyone has to know about the way our brains work is that we handle about, you know, four novel pieces of information at a time, max. You know, the old idea was like, oh, the number is seven. But like the more people have researched this and looked at like what, what really counts as novel and how do you measure novelty, etc., they'd bring it down to four. And it's probably less than that in terms of like our ability to sort of take new concepts and sort of manipulate them and move them around and sort of think about them in our brains. It's because our working memory capacity is, you know, fundamentally very limited. Simultaneously, you have a huge, uh, huge library of prior knowledge, which is almost, you know, infinite if you think about how many gigabytes or terabytes could be stored in there. So like right. we have this insane sort of long-term storage and this, you know, very finite short-term storage. So, you know, one of the things I would say about an approach to teaching is it's got to be an approach that sort of meets people where they are. If they have some prior knowledge about the uh, subject, that needs to sort of be brought to the fore. If it's incorrect prior knowledge, that needs to be brought to the fore, which is why I think any of these conversations around teaching fundamental physics around, you know, forces in motion, you have to deal with these fundamental misconceptions around, you know, okay, so if I'm in my car, I need to push down on the accelerator. So I'm applying a force to my car and that's what keeps it moving, right? A force to keep something moving is a fundamental concept that basically everyone has. To switch that over from you know, balanced forces maintain motion or no net forces maintain motion is a real shift Mm -hmm. and it messes with people's heads. Fundamentally, the idea of inertia is very, 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 very difficult for people. So 
And yeah. So, so you know, for me, it's always been about you know, like a really big, big part of this is I need to uh, limit the amount of novel information. Then I need to get people to practice this sort of uh, thing that I'm trying to get them to learn. And then I need them to master it before we go on and do something else. Uh, a fundamental issue with all introductory physics courses is the idea of acceleration, which is almost impossible to perceive. Like you don't, you don't look like look at a falling object and say, I see that thing speeding up. You only know that because, well, once you know physics, you understand why it should be speeding up and why it should, its velocity should be zero when you let go and faster mm -hmm. when you catch it. Um, and even though that the, like you think like, oh, it should be obvious. Like I can see it. I'm a physicist. I can see it. But the new people coming into it, like if you actually look at the observations, they can't see it. So <laughs> if, if, you, if you don't see acceleration, you can't perceive it. And then you're going to do a whole bunch of math calculations around this concept. And you think you know what it is, but actually you're thinking of acceleration as though it's a velocity, which you can more readily see then you bring all all sorts of incorrect ideas in and everything gets mumbled. Mm -hmm. I, I see this, this uh, you know, a lot of people come out of physics, uh, like their first physics course or something, and they say, like, I'm just not a physics person. And they also say things like, you know, I thought I got it, and then I got to the test and I got everything wrong. Like, all of these types of observations, for me, align with this concept of, like, it's easy to fool yourself into thinking you, you know what it is uh, or because you're just sort of thinking about your preconceptions are, are what you think is the way the world works and those have to be challenged. I don't know. So there are some general principles. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think like largely the things we do wrong is we have these one hour lectures in physics where a lot of uh, novel information is presented and you lose everyone and yeah. maybe they think they understand it because they already had ideas about this beforehand, but their their prior ideas are not being challenged and a whole bunch of novel stuff's being introduced. And to the le and to the lecture, it all makes sense because they have these very complex structures in long-term memory making it seem like it's not that novel. But if you're not, you know, this is the problem of the expert. If you, if you have those structures, you can't see the world the same way that the novice does. So those are all the ways in which I think we, we get it wrong. Yeah. And I think, like, for me... It, I want to see a lot of small chunks of information followed by a lot of practice and mastery before we move on to the next thing. So I'd say th those are sort of the biggest, the biggest things to hit. Hmm. Very good list. That's, that's an interesting challenge to universities then, I guess, if, if they move. Huge. Yeah. Dang. What, do you, so one thing I've noticed, um, Derek, when I was in um, graduate school, um, I really kind of started to really realize how much I didn't value lectures. <laughs> um, so I was like, uh, it just felt like I was going there to just basically show my face and get in good graces with my professor. And that was pretty much it. Um, do you think that there, do you have, have you, since you are in education, I would imagine you've probably thought of, is there something that you believe to supersede the lecture or do you think the lecture is pretty good, but it just needs maybe some tweaking or what, what's your take on that? I have, I have so many thoughts. I mean, <laughs> excellent. What, uh, one one thought is, you know, when I was doing my undergrad, when I like first year high school, I never never skipped a class. My first year university, I went to barely half of them. <laughs> um, in second year, I remember I taught my friends to crochet. We used to go to our applied physics lectures and sit there and like <laughs> crochet mittens and hats. Yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. I had a buddy who, who in the first year calculus lecture, he was like reading Moby Dick in the first in the first row because we <laughs> so, were jerks like that. That's so funny. Um, but okay, so a couple things. One is that I I feel like uh, lectures in the right hands can be great, and lectures in the wrong hands can be terrible. You know, it's kind of like this thing about like our books better than movies or our, our lectures better than like interactive computer programs. Mm -hmm. The answer is always like what actually depends on what's the lecture doing. Um, you know, if you were to look at my lectures when I when I gave lectures, I actually handed out physical pieces of paper cards, one that said A, B and C and, and another one that said C, D so that people could hold up cards I would ask them questions as I was going. And when I was teaching to a group of 14, the, 
the way I would approach my class is, you know, I don't want to say anything that I think my students can say for me. So I'd always be like, you know, starting my lecture or starting my, my, my class with sort of recaps of where we're at and just rapid firing, you know, at like a random assortment of, of students to get them to, to like activate, tell me what they're thinking. So I think like that's a very effective way to, to teach and to learn is like, People have to be thinking about it and they have to be engaged. They have to be switched on. They have to be attentive. And there are various like tools you can use to do that. For me, like the more you can ask questions of the students as you go and get feedback immediately, like, the better off you are. Um, so I guess that that's my thinking. I don't know if there's anything that supersedes the lecture. I have been very anti a move to like online or like a computer tutor or something like that. And I feel like the whole COVID experience is going to bear me out on this, where like a lot of people are trying to switch over to online learning. The teachers are finding it's a lot harder to teach this way. And the students are finding it's a lot harder to learn this way because fundamentally we're social animals. We like to be in a room with other people. We like to, you know, if we're going to work on something, we need to feel accountable to someone like someone's going to look at, you know, check our homework yeah. and, and, you know, tell us that we need to be better or tell us we need to work harder or tell us like you need to do problems, you know, one through five or whatever. It, it just becomes very difficult for anyone when it's just sort of self-directed. It's the same reason why like gyms are everywhere, but people aren't ripped, you know, if they've got a gym <laughs> membership. But if you've got a personal trainer, then you can move up, you know, because that personal trainer is someone you're accountable to. You're setting the time to meet with that person. And as, you know, like all those things I feel like, fit with our psychology much better mm -hmm. than this idea of like, you know, there's textbooks out there. People aren't just typically learning GR out of a textbook. It happens, but it's not the common way. You know, it's much better to have, have a lecturer who can, you know, help you parse it and tell you what you need to be studying next and, you know, answer any questions and stuff like that. So, you know, I don't know. I feel like a classroom experience can be the, the, the best uh, learning experience. Typically, you know, smaller classes, the better, but, you know, economics are, you know, what they are and that that's the challenge. Interesting. You make some good points there. Um, it seems accountability is a very critical part to that whole system. And then also, like you yeah. said, the whole lecturer depends on the person. Mm -hmm. But then I kind of yeah. wonder, is there it's a like, way It's to like a video. You know, when I, when I looked at my videos, like I made some videos that were totally useless for learning <laughs> and I made some videos that could double people's pretest score. And then if you looked at like their perceptions of the video or their perceptions of the learning experience, they were the same. Like how much, how much did their confidence in, increase in the accuracy of their answers? The same. But like one group learned nothing and the other group doubled their score. So my, <laughs> point, my point being that like that, that was a nice contained little five minute video or whatever. Right. But you can make a video that makes people feel like they're learning and makes them feel good and more confident. And you can also make a video that actually makes them learn. Oh, that's uh, very interesting. Yeah. So, so I, like, I, I feel like I have the data to say, like, you know, it depends on what's in the presentation. You know, it, it depends what's in the lecture. Huh. Yeah. I never thought about that one. That's really interesting. Can we, can we go on that one a little bit? So <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of curious. What were the, what sure. do you think were the factors, the big factors that were in place that made a video make you feel like more you effective? Learning? Oh yeah. Even, so yeah. so just just any any kind of like clear presentation. So uh, I I tried this with Newton's laws for example. Just really basic cuz at, at University of Sydney there's about 8 or 900 students who come in and do a, a first year physics class. So I had access to all these students and I made them go online and they were randomly assigned to see a video. One of the, one of which I called the exposition which was essentially just like a lecturer being like Look, here's the deal with Newton's first law. First law, and it, and it'd be like textbook definition. We actually pulled the definition out of a textbook, <laughs> and then then we would like illustrate it with like animations. We'd get people to do like a, a an actual demonstration, either with like juggling balls or with a car going up and down a ramp, or you know like all these sorts of real world examples. We'd have like graphs, animations, like basically everything you can show a kid to to explain it as clearly as you can. So they'd come out of that, they'd feel confident, they would feel like the video was a good use of their time, they'd feel like they learned something, and then we would look at their pre- and post-test scores, and for the fundamental students, that is, students who hadn't had a strong background in physics, there was no gain, like statistically zero improvement. But if we showed those students a video where there was a dialogue between someone who was like pretending to be a student and someone who was pretending to be a tutor, and the student would say something wrong, like, 
you know, I think when I throw the ball in the air, there's a there's a force in the ball that drives it up against the force of gravity, and then at the top, gravity wins, or, or at, the to at the top they're balanced, and then gravity wins, and the ball uh, uh, falls down. And then the student and the tutor would like continue to talk, and they'd eventually come around to the right thing. But um, the point is, we would add in this one video, we would add multiple incorrect conceptions of like what the graph should look like. Oh, I think it should look like this. And they're like, hmm, does that make sense? Because should it look like... So anyway, so we made something that was more complicated, but something that was a dialogue between a student and a tutor where the student had the most common misconceptions. That video presentation doubled their scores. Um, That's And, and really it took cool. longer, but, but it actually addressed their prior knowledge. You could have you could have said looking at us going in to do the experiment that we were going to screw kids up doing that because we were like actually presenting and illustrating animating misconceptions. Yeah. But people were smart enough to follow the whole, you know, dialogue and realize which was the right answer and which was the common wrong answer, which was also talked about in that video. So that, that turned out to be more effective. Man, that is so powerful um, because yeah. that I mean, that basically shows a win for the Socratic method in some sense, because, you know, the whole Socrates method is ask questions and kind of guide the person to that answer. Um, that's a little bit different, though, because you're actually saying that the questions are even the wrong ones, and then they can maybe even explain why it's wrong. Or, so, or the yeah. answers are the wrong ones, and, and, that's, and that's partly you know, where the Socratic dialogue comes in. I mean, that, that played into my thinking a lot, this idea of vicarious learning or Socratic learning, this idea that like in lectures, what we kind of need is, is question asking, but that doesn't happen very often because you know, students don't feel like, you know, I don't want to be the one who looks like an idiot and whatever, and I don't want to slow us down or whatever. And because of that, the questions don't don't get asked and because of that you know the class just moves on and and the the teacher thinks everyone's following but they're not so I feel like that's the most common sort of one of the most common issues by the way I should mention we showed the same sorts of presentations to uh, advanced stream of students who had more of a background in physics and then all the videos were equally effective Very partly that could be to a ceiling effect like they came in and scored high enough on the pretest that there wasn't enough room to show whatever the gain gotcha but like all the videos seemed to be similarly effective if you had more prior knowledge it was like mm -hmm. just the refresher helped them mm -hmm. but but the lower the prior knowledge or the lower the sort of background in physics the more important it was to address this these sort of misconceptions which i think makes sense dang Derek, if you ever um, are going to make another video, you should do it on this. <laughs> I feel like I, I think, want to see that I think, very like, badly. I think the video in Science of Thinking is kind of there. I also made a video way back, you know, called uh, uh, Khan Academy and the Effectiveness of of Science Videos or something. Because oh, it's kind okay. of this idea of like being really clear is not a great strategy in areas where there are uh, common misconceptions. Because mm -hmm. it'll make people think that they get it, but they won't actually get it. So, mm -hmm. Man, so that is... anyway, if you if you want to see my videos on that, there's that. I also made like a, a kind of TED talk about this. So yeah, know. okay, cool. Yeah, there's, this is there's really stuff close out to there. Your expertise as well. Yeah, very cool, very cool. So um, so I guess Derek, uh, you said you weren't so enthralled with research, but um, did you actually have to do uh, research during your undergraduate? Uh, I got involved in some projects. Uh, one thing I got involved with was the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory in Canada. So in the summer after third year, I went up and, you know, helped out with detector operations for this, like, giant sphere of heavy water uh, mm -hmm. a couple miles, uh, probably about a mile underground that was mm -hmm. detecting neutrinos. So that, you know, that's something I got involved with. I guess something else was like in fourth year, we did a, a research project. Mine was on like a, an object location device, kind of like a uh, radio frequency identification device kind of tag for uh, finding lost objects, things like that. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's a certain amount of research, I guess, to an extent. Yeah. I, I don't know if that answers your question. Well, that does. S save, save physics, save physics education research, right? If you could go do research right now drop everything like what would you study what what problem go be would you, a, go would you go study? be a researcher yeah if you had to if you had like let's yeah let's say if you had if I, have, to. if I had to pick something to research i mean like i've thought a lot about you know how, how a lot of stuff in the biospace is pretty exciting right now mm. like around say crispr or you know a lot of the stuff that's happening around genetics and um 
I think that's interesting. Why, you know, why? looking at what's happening in terms of anti-aging and, and sort of life extension uh, type research. I feel like there's a lot of interesting stuff there. If I were on the science side uh, or like the, the sort of more physics side, I, I wonder where would I put my efforts? I feel like one of the challenges is like I, I, I'm kind of turned off by, <laughs> you know, CERN, CERN style big science, you know, uh, just feels mm. like you're, you're a tiny cog. Like one yeah. of the things for me was like I always wanted to feel like I was making this kind of unique contribution and I don't know, in that area it becomes, I don't know. The, uh, again, this is just like, I feel like this is a personality thing more than it is like a you know, mm. actual problem with the research. It's just like, and, and, and this is something that I, I like, I counsel to anyone out there who's in science is to think about, you know, like what's the day-to-day -day work of it? Would I have loved to have made the contributions that Einstein made? Yeah, I, you know, if I could have done the quantum, you know, electrodynamics papers and stuff, you know, like, yeah, great. If I could have explained the photoelectric effect, like that feels like something I could have done. Um, yeah. Maybe, but maybe I'm fooling myself. Um, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, like the, yeah. that, that all seems like amazing. I would have loved to do that. But what is the day-to-day -day work of, of being, doing that job? And I just mm -hmm. feel like it's not a great mesh for my personality, which is, you know, I want to be, you know, I love learning about science. So like doing what I do now is great because I get to learn about it. And then I get to sort of figure out a creative way to talk about it and, and show it. And then I get to move on and do something else. So, you know, I'm not, you know, setting a year of my life or five years of my life, you know, studying C. elegans or something. That's a little worm, or, you know, <laughs> yeah. like whatever. Yeah. I'm sure that's cool, but like, it's not for me. So, no, I think I'm know, right I, there with I, you. I, I, I can make say. I can make one bomb video about it, and then <laughs> but then I can move on. You know, I don't have to you know spend yeah. ten years. So right. I, I really think it's a personality thing. Yeah, yeah I 100 percent agree with you, man. Um, that's why I'm kind of hoping that I can somehow get this podcast uh, enough money to I can just do my own <laughs> physics. <laughs> yeah, kind of in the same realm as you. You know, where you can have uh, yeah, yeah. You can you can do the things that interest you instead of having to go five years hard onto one tiny, tiny subset of a field. Yep. But so, really, we wanted you to just say condensed matter physics was the best area of research. Yeah, I kind of, I was looking for that. <laughs> I, was just, I was just thinking of that in my head. I was like, would I say material science? There's something about material science that always has seemed like uncool to me, <laughs> but yeah, I get just, it. just because it's like, you know, it's like, it's materials, whatever. It's like, yeah, oh, yeah. this is made out of steel. This is, but yeah. like simultaneously, I think there is cool stuff there. So like if someone comes up with a high temperature superconductor, that's killer, yeah. you know, or whatever. Quantum computers are in that realm too, in yeah. some sense. Yeah. 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 So we got some cool stuff. Yeah. Don't be a hater. <laughs> I got it. I got it. <laughs> yeah. When it, when it gets discovered, I'll come and film it and I'll make an awesome video about it. So. Sweet, man. Cool. Sweet. Good stuff. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah. Well, really I long. just kind of wanted to get more into like, uh, like, you know, physicists get this, this bad rep, not, not bad rep, but we kind of get characterized as like nerdy kind of. You know, very uh, stereotypically saying. characterized, but I mean, it makes sense. Sheldon right? from, uh, you know, the <laughs> from Big, Big Bang. Bang Theory. Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Do you, do right. you roll your? You kind of rolled your eyes a little bit there. I don't think I roll my eyes. You can, you can watch the tape. I did not roll my eyes. I was thinking about it. Internal, he rolled. Yeah, his I eyes. mean, I mean, so so here's my thought about that. You know, there's people maybe like you guys, or maybe like me, or you know, I know some other people who who love to get out there and on social media and say like, look, you know, we're not all crazy nerds. We're like some of us are fun people, and you know, we can we can go have have a blast or whatever. <laughs> But my sense is, you know, the people who are saying those sorts of things are typically people who are more on, like, the science communication end of the spectrum. Yeah. Like, because, because yeah. like, we have social skills and because, you know, <laughs> look, I don't want to talk badly about our, our compatriots. The point being, like, if you really enjoy your research and being there, you know, 24-7 or whatever, and, and you're really into it, typically you have less of an interest in sort of being an extrovert or being, you know, on a podcast or something like that. So mm -hmm. right. I feel like there is this natural stratification. There's a reason why, you know, certain personality types are attracted to certain types of work. And like, I don't know, I, to me, that feels like that explains a certain amount of the stereotype. And as much as we want to say like, you know, cool people do science too, like Brian Cox or, you know, Bill Nye, it's like, yeah, but they didn't end up just doing science because like their personality and their skill set is more suited to this thing that's you know uh, the, the science communication side Very so true. anyway that that's that's my sense is that like maybe the the stereotypes are 
you know, somewhat deserved. And I don't know if that's okay. Like yeah, different people, yeah. different personality types, like different, different things. Yeah. Well, sp- very speak- good answer. Yeah. Speaking of like, like Brian Cox, right. He used to be in like a band. Did you ever, yeah, play, yeah. did you ever play music or do I any did, instruments? I did. Stuff? I was actually in a band too. Uh, oh, cool. I played like the engineering bar uh, back at Queens. Cool. I was like, in theory, the lead singer of our band, but like, oh, I don't think shit. I was very good because we didn't, we didn't make it very far, you know, <laughs> I, I sang in another band in, uh, in Australia, you know, like. Early on in the Veritasium channel, the thing I thought that was going to take it big was these like scientific music videos made a video about gravity, you know, John Mayer's song Gravity, but made it actually about gravity. (laughs) Um, I I took this uh, duet from like Miss Saigon and made it about atomic bonding. Um, What else did I do? I did like Jason Mraz, I'm yours, but I changed it to I'm Adams and it was all about chemistry. So I really thought that's the thing that was going to, it was going to blow up for me. Uh, yeah. Did not happen. So I've stopped making the, you know, I even have a, uh, a song about friction, yeah. um, but I've never released it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's uh, the song from Santana featuring Rob Thomas called Smooth. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah <laughs> the song's yeah, yeah. all about. It's, Classic. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, I was I was in a band. I was in a couple that, bands, and uh, and I also played French horn. So uh, yeah, I have a, a sort of musical background. Yeah. Dang, that's a difficult one. Yeah, he knows about classical music than I. Yeah, because the French horn's the one that you got to stick your hand in there, and it's oof. <laughs> when you hear bad French horn players, it's really bad. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. It's like it's most brutal. bad instruments. Yeah, can sound really. Terrible. But especially there's something about the brass ones where it's just like, dang. Mm, it's really yeah. hard to play those instruments. I feel, I feel for them. <laughs> Your people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did you have any other hobbies, I guess, besides uh, playing instruments and stuff? Instruments, bands. I enjoyed running, going to the beach. You know, I moved back to Sydney uh, after after college, and that's where I went, did my PhD. But you know, going to the beach there a lot was was yeah. one of my favorite things to do, or going going on hikes and stuff. Yesterday, I was out trying to hike with the family. We were trying to go uh, on this, like, two-mile loop. And, like, we thought maybe we got to, like, the halfway point. We were about to go back on the loop. Right. And, and like, I had to look at the map, and I was like, oh, man, we gone like, 500 feet. <laughs> oh, no. And, it, and at this point, we had, like, both kids in meltdown mode. Oh, no. oh, one was like, I'm not walking. The other one was like, yeah, he was just running around in circles and Mm -hmm. anyway so i ended up like kind of carrying both of them (laughs) um back down the hill it was rough it was brutal and we're trying to like be socially distant my older one's like i don't need to hold my mask and anyway you know the whole thing so 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 i guess i guess yeah speaking of dad problems i guess last we're gonna be wrapping up in a bit but um did you are you are you like hoping that your kids turn into scientists are you being like more uh holistic i guess just saying like you know i'm gonna let you be what you want to be kind of thing like i i feel like at the minute i don't have to make a strong decision on how i'm gonna behave vis-a-vis you know questions like that like like uh idealistically my vision for being a parent is that I, i will be very open with my kids and that i won't force them to you know do the things that that I like or find things interesting the way I find them interesting. It's still going to be tough if my kids aren't like academically inclined because I was, you know, uh, mm. so it's going to feel weird if they're not into studying or like getting good grades or, you know, excelling in that part of their lives. And it'll probably cause me some deep distress. <laughs> um, but I want to find a way to be okay with that. Yeah. Um, but I don't know if I will be, you know, because like I'm a, at, at my core, I'm a teacher. I'm yeah. you know someone who seeks like knowledge is is really useful and helpful and it's powerful and like we should embrace it. And you know, I'm just gonna want to jump in there and be like, no, 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 come sit with me and like yeah. let's let's work this out. You know, yeah. Um, I don't know because I'm I, gonna try to fight that urge. Like yeah. I just I I want them to do the things they want to do. Um, as long as they've got things that they're passionate in and like that they they want to focus on and spend time on, then that's cool. How would I take it if my kid turned out to be like a gamer and he just wants to sit in front of his computer twenty four seven? Like that's gonna be hard. <laughs> hey, bro, well, gamers are making money. I know that's you know? right. So, like, who am I to say? Yeah, right? if he's on Twitch streaming, you know, making bank. That's right. Gotta let him do his Hands thing. Off. You know, that's right. <laughs> you never know. Be yeah, the next I know. ninja. That's the hard part. <laughs>
<laughs> well, there's a lot of years before you end up making bank on Twitch. So, I mean, that's 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 a challenge. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, yeah, um, man. I know you you got to you pretty much said oh, yeah. that you uh, we don't want to keep yeah we don't want to keep you too long but uh, we just want to say thank you yes Derek it was on. a great pleasure man and we've learned uh, a lot today for sure yeah as I'm sure our viewership will as well um, but yeah I guess let's start wrapping up um, I guess to close it out Derek I wanted to ask you uh, a fun question so um, oh, we These all have been fun questions <laughs> oh great fun great questions. great but this one is yeah, a little bit fun. out there but fun squared yeah yeah so yeah, my no. question to you, I've asked this to other viewers. Um, what do you think about UFOs, man? Aliens? Oh, no. What do I think about UFOs? Yeah. I was thinking about this last night, actually, strangely. The reason I was thinking about it was because I was thinking, like, do I want to have a conversation with, with say, another YouTuber who's maybe a conspiracy theorist or, or on some sort of a weird part of, a, uh, of the political Sub spectrum, yeah. which leads them to promote certain things or whatever. Oh, and I was, was thinking us? like, I was thinking, <laughs> I was thinking like UFO is something that I could like, I could probably bring up without touching on political issues as like a kind of issue to deal with where like some people believe these things exist and other people don't like, and, and, and the question I always want to ask is like, how would you know if you're wrong? So I was even thinking about this last night about myself. Like, so my take on UFOs, okay. People can see things. They're not aliens, probably. Aliens probably have never come to us. Aliens probably do exist in other parts of our universe. Our universe is probably too vast for them to have come to us. And even if even if they were around, would they bother coming to have a look or or you know interfere with what's going on in our lives? Probably not. I don't know. That's so. Yeah, that's my feeling about UFOs. How would I know if I was wrong? I was like, well, if suddenly like some sort of death ray came out of the sky and like the earth was blowing up, like in the last seconds before I blew up, I'd be like, man, I was wrong. There's aliens out there and they're mean. Um, how, how, how else would I know if I was wrong? I was like, what if I had a personal experience with an alien? And then I was like, mm -hmm. even that, like as convincing as that would be, I would feel like the, the conclusion that I was having some weird hallucination and was like ill or had a tumor, like yeah. would be a more likely path than like aliens have come and, and, and shown me something. Um, I don't know what kind of evidence, like, I guess if the whole world embraced it, if, 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 uh, the government said, you know, we've detected these objects, you can see them at the night, they look like this, they're sending us messages. I don't know, if, if SETI was involved and was saying, like, we've picked up this cryptographic message, we're sending it around to all these researchers, we're trying to, I don't know. I feel like there are things that might change my mind about the existence of UFOs. As of right now, I would say yeah. that people see things and uh, make up whatever they want to believe and, you know, just given the scale of our universe and such, like... Yeah. aliens exist they probably haven't visited us I, th yeah. I think truthfully anybody the generation that grew up with x-files you know you want to believe <laughs> do we <laughs> the truth it, is out there man. yeah the truth it, is out it there would, it would be cool it would just yeah but <laughs> nevertheless yeah excellent excellent yeah. well derek we appreciate you man um once again guys make sure to check out veritasium i'm sure everybody knows you already um it's probably your viewership coming to us if anything <laughs> <laughs> but you know guys uh check them out on Twitter, Veritasium on Twitter, on Instagram, Veritasium, the Veritasium.com website. And Derek, you also have some interesting stuff uh, for sale, though. Snatums look pretty cool. You want to talk about that or any future projects you have coming up, man? Uh, I do have some Snatums lying around. <laughs> uh, you yeah. know, like I used to teach like chemistry type stuff. So, you know, when those really strong little spherical magnets came out, I was thinking like, wouldn't it be cool if we had... An, an atom kit where it's like ball and sticks, but there's no sticks and the atoms just connect magnetically to each other. So that is what, what Snatoms are. I kickstarted that five years ago and I still sell them to this day on Amazon and, and Snatoms.com. So if anyone wants to check them out, they can. I just made a new Sweet. version of the big kit where there's now little holes in the sides where the magnets are. So the magnets can actually touch each other. Before they were behind plastic, I was a little bit paranoid. Like mm. Magnets would come out, people would swallow them and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but uh, But yeah. So now that now they can stick together and they're a little stronger bonding and stuff like that. So, yeah, cool, cool stuff. Any any other projects? That's about it. Uh, I got another kid coming in uh, six weeks. Oh, so. that's, wow. that's an eighteen-year project. 
Yeah, it's yeah. an eighteen year project. That's a huge probably one. more. I'm, I'm gonna be busy. <laughs> yeah. There might be more projects coming out on YouTube soon, like some some bigger YouTube stuff, but uh that's probably as much as I can say about it at the minute. But yeah, that's where I wanna focus my energy now. Like I, I love doing YouTube and yeah. you know, if I can just do that, like I'll be I'll be happy. Cool. Awesome, man. Well congrats on the kid. And uh Thank you. Yeah, and all the success, man. It was great. Yes talking indeed. To you. All right, Derek. Thanks so much, man. And we will see you guys and see you all later. Ta ta. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Yeah. No problem. I was gonna I was gonna make a joke, but I couldn't fit it in. Oh no, because I was talking too much. <laughs> no, no, because that was great, man. It was about it was about uh how you were born in Australia and you moved to Canada. And then like like I was like, did you have like a, a crisis almost of identity where you were just like saying things like you call that a knife, eh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. You should have done you should have thrown that in there. <laughs> or like a knife, you know, eh? <laughs> <laughs> so you've played knifey spoony before. <laughs> I'm sorry that a dingo ate your baby. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Like these are great. These are fire. Yeah, you should put these in. <laughs> just, just cut into the podcast and be like, yeah, I'm doing it. <laughs>